Hi students, happy to meet you all through this uh, COA web team. I hope you are all uh, safe and in sound health. So from today we are starting the biology classes. Uh, please pay attention. Uh, please note that uh, these classes will not be taken again in the classrooms. So this is what is the teaching for these lessons. So uh, pay attention and take notes. And if you have any doubts, you can always ask us. Right. Before entering into today's topic, I would like to talk a few minutes about the lockdown, today's lockdown. As you are aware that today we are facing a major threat, a pandemic, because of the virus COVID-19. It's a RNA virus which spreads through air and also through fomites. Fomites means any objects what we are using, say for example the mobile we are using, the door where we are having the knobs, the staircase where we climb, the lift what we are using. So all these comes under foment. So the virus spreads through air as well as the aerosols which get deposited in the fomites, it transmits the disease. And the major problem here is once the virus infects a person, it will take an average of 14 days to express the symptoms. This period is called as the incubation period. Within this incubation period, if the person enters into a population, say for example, he is the infected person. If he enters his population, within the 14 days, the risk, which means that he will not have any symptoms, but he will be spreading the disease. So, it keeps on spreading through whomever he is coming in contact. So, so here you can see that he has spread it to three persons. And these three persons, in turn, will spread to others. So this is how the transmission is occurring. So it has taken many lives all around the world, which started from China. Now it's everywhere in the world. So why we have this lockdown is we are isolating the persons who are having the infection. Say for example, in this case, all these people if they are isolated, if they are taken out from the population. So we have some eight people. These people are isolated, which means that they are removed from the population. So these people will be treated for the infection. So virus, it will be restricted to this part of the world. And if you see here, there is no infected persons. There is no infected person within the population. So the virus cannot spread in this population. So basically what we are doing is, we are restricting the virus not to reproduce. So the virus will not have any host to reproduce. So once the reproduction is done, the virus will get extinct. That is what we are planning for. That is what we have given the lockdown. So any person, even if he is not having any symptom, within this lockdown period he will develop the symptom and he could be quarantined. So the population will remain safe and he could be treated separately. So the moral of the story is, the virus cannot reproduce, so it will become extinct. So if an organism is not able to reproduce, it will become extinct. And that's the topic for today, human reproduction. For an individual, in order to be alive, maintaining the homeostasis is essential, which means the BP, the salt concentration, the oxygen content, the pH of the blood, everything need to be within the normal limit, which is called as the homeostasis. If anything is changing with respect to the environment, without any control, that will lead to the death of the individual. So as homeostasis is individual to the individual, a population for it to survive, it needs reproduction. If any population is not surviving, that is not reproducing, it will not survive, it will become extinct. As Darwin has said that, 
it is a fitness of the organism he has specifically mentioned that the reproductive fitness of the organism it will make the particular species to increase in number and become dominant and this is called as natural selection so today let's see about the human reproductive system so first let us see in human reproduction what are all the functions of human reproduction and what is the process of human reproduction and the classification of the reproductive organs so first we will see the functions of reproductive organs the first function is to produce gametes so the reproductive organs will produce the gametes like sperm and ovum the second is these gametes need to be transported that is the sperm which is produced in the male needs to be transported to the female and that fertilization will occur and that from the fallopian tube it will move into the uterus all these functions are done by the reproductive system and then sustaining the gametes the gametes because the gamete need to be alive to undergo fertilization and to develop into a embryo the third is nurture the gametes since they are living cells they need to be provided with food and other uh, <coughs> essential things so these are provided by the reproductive system for the reproductive system it produces hormones if you see the reproductive system is mainly regulated by the hormones which are secreted by both the pituitary gland as well as the gonads now let us see the functions of reproductive system sorry the process involved in the reproductive system the first and foremost process is gametogenesis as i said earlier it involves the production of sperm and ovum so this is the first stage the second stage is insemination insemination is a transfer of the male gamete and from the male gamete into the female reproductive tract that is called as insemination and third is fertilization in the fertilization stage the male and female gametes they fuse together to form a zygote which is diploid so this is the formation of zygote and fourth is cleavage cleavage means these are a series of divisions which will convert the single cell zygote into a multicellular blastula so here <coughs> here single cell zygote is converted into a multicellular blastula next is implantation now that the blastula has formed through the fallopian tubule it will reach as the uterine cavity and there it will get attached to the uterine wall so that the embryo will get all nourishment and it can develop into an embryo into a new baby so the attachment of the blastula with the endometrial wall it is called as implantation and six is placentation for the embryo to grow it needs nourishment and what are the excretory products which are formed that need to be removed from the embryo so a connection is needed between the embryo and the mother that is placenta so the formation of the structure which will connect the developing embryo and the mother's endometrium that formation of the placenta is called as placentation and gastrulation it is a process in which there is lot of cell movement within the blastocyst and the blastocyst will be converted into a gastrula and this gastrula will have all the three layers next is organogenesis we have seen during gastrulation the three primary layers are formed from these three primary layers the tissues 
organs will start arising. So this process of formation of organs from the primary layers is called sarcoidosis and parturition. It is the delivery of the baby and the other embryonic membranes. These are expelled out of the uterus and through the vagina it is passed over. This process is called as parturition. Now let us see that how the reproductive organs are classified. They are basically classified into primary and accessory. Primary organs, their main function is to produce the gametes. So in male, it is a testis which produces spermatozoa, and female, it is the ovary which produces the egg. What is the role of these accessory organs? The accessory organs, they help in the transport and sustaining of the gametes as well as the egg. Apart from this, as I said earlier, reproduction is mainly regulated by hormones, especially by the hormones produced in the pituitary gland and by the hormones which are produced in the gonads. These hormones, they are responsible for the development of secondary sexual characters, the growth, development and function of the reproductive organs. The first structure in uh, male reproductive system is a scrotum. The scrotum is actually it is a pouch. This is the scrotum. It's more like a pouch. And it has two separate sacs inside. Two separate sacs. This scrotum, it ensures to maintain the temperature of the testis because the test is to be functional it should be 2 to 2.5 degree lesser than the body's temperature so the test is which is situated inside the scrotum when the body temperature is high it will move down so that it will lose some temperature and it can maintain its optimal temperature when the environmental temperature is very low, the testis will move up. It gets attached with the abdominal cavity and it will get some heat from the cells of the abdomen so it can maintain its optimal temperature. So the scrotum helps in doing this function. And this scrotum is highly pigmented so it appears dark in color the testis is connected to the abdominal cavity through the inguinal canal a spermatic cord passes through the inguinal canal which connects the testis with the abdominal cavity the spermatic cord is made up of a artery which helps in supplying blood to the testis and a vein which will take the deoxygenated blood from the testis. The vein also helps in taking the hormones produced by the testis which are taken by the vein and which will be poured into the blood circulation. Apart from this, Obviously, the vas deferens, it also passes through the spermatic cord. The spermatic cord also involves a nerve to help in sensation of the testis. So the spermatic cord altogether, it involves a spermatic artery, vein, vas deferens, a nerve and few connective tissues. Next is the structure of testis. Testis is a primary male sexual organ. If you see the cross section of testis, it has three membranes the outermost tunica vaginalis, next to that is a tunica albigenia, 
and tunica vasculosa tunica albigenia it's a white membrane and tunica vasculosa it is highly vascularized which means it is richly supplied with uh, blood vessels and the test is it has uh, compartments called as lobules the testicular lobules there are approximately 200 to 250 such lobules in each testis within the lobules there are highly coiled tubes which are called as the seminiferous tubules these are the structures where the spermatozoa is produced and these tubules are present one or two tubules in each lobules these tubules get connected with a reticular structure which is called as a reti testis so the reti testis collects all the seminiferous tubules contents and then it gets connected with a highly coiled structure called as a epididymis epididymis it is present on the posterior side of the testis epi means above and didymis means twins since there are two testes and these structures are present over the testes it is called as the epididymis if you see the structure of the epididymis it is divided into three parts one is the head part which is called as a caput epididymis and the corpus epididymis and the caudal epididymis which is the tail part so the contents from the seminiferous tubule it reaches the retis testis and then it is delivered into the epididymis the epididymis it's a highly coiled structure and you if you extend the epididymis it will come up to 6 meters and it helps in the maturation of the spermatozoa say for example if you take a spermatid from here from the epididymis and if you observe its movement it will be able to move in a spiral manner but it will be in the same place but if you take a sperm from the vas deferens that is the next structure the spermatozoa will be rotating spirally but it will be able to move forward so these two structures the epididymis and the vas deferens they help in the maturation of the spermatozoa it potentiates it the epididymis from the caudal part it becomes the vas deferens the vas deferens it moves up it passes through the inguinal canal which we have seen earlier it loops over the urinary bladder and before joining with the urethra it gets connected with two seminal vesicles once a vas deferens it joins with the seminal vesicle it will be called as ejaculatory ducts so we have seen that the vas deferens it loops over the urinary bladder and then it meets the seminal vesicle once it gets connected with the seminal vesicle then it's called as ejaculatory duct this ejaculatory duct passes through the prostate and then it opens into the urethra the urethra it's a common pathway for both the urine as well as the semen it's approximately 20 centimeters in length it has three parts the one which starts from the urinary bladder which passes through the prostrate it is called as the prostrate urethra this part and it carries only urine and the second is the membranous urethra which lies beneath the pubis symphysis and the third part is a part which passes through the penis and it is called as the p 
penile urethra. Now let's see the accessory glands involved in male reproductive system. Here you can see the seminal vesicle. This is the one we saw that which gets connected with the uh, vas deferens. The seminal, seminal vesicle, it produces a fluid which is alkaline in nature. This alkaline nature of the fluid will neutralize the acidity in the vagina of the female reproductive system. Thereby it helps the spermatozoa to survive in the female reproductive system. Apart from alkalinity, the seminal vesicle also contains proteins, enzymes, ascorbic acid, fructose. This fructose is utilized by the spermatozoa for motility. Apart from that, it also contains some amount of vitamin C, flavins, and it also contains prostaglandins. The prostaglandins helps in the contraction of the seminal vesicle during ejaculation which helps in propelling the semen. It also contains some coagulating enzymes which enhances the sperm motility. The second vesicle is a, the second gland is a prostate gland. Here you can see the prostate gland. It, uh, it surrounds the urethra. Just, it lies just below the urinary bladder and it surrounds the urethra and it secretes the prostatic fluid which is an important component of semen. The prostatic fluid, it contains enzymes, zinc and citric acid. The enzyme PSA, that is prostate specific antigen, prostate specific antigen produced by this prostate gland, it helps in liquefying the semen. The next gland in the male reproductive system is the bulbo-urethral gland. It is P-shaped gland. It lies beneath the prostate gland. This adds fluid to the semen during ejaculation. It is a clear thick fluid which helps in lubrication. Apart from that, it washes out the acidic condition in the urethra because if there is a passage of urine in the recent past because of the uric acid this path may be acidic in nature so when the semen passes through this it may kill the spermatozoa so the fluid secretion of this bulbo urethral gland it washes away this uh, part of the urethra it makes semen less water. This diagram shows a cross-section of the seminiferous tubules. We have seen that these tubules are located in the lobules present in the testis. See, these circular structures are the seminiferous tubules. And this shows a cross-section. And between the tubules, there are some spaces which are occupied by the interstitial cells. It is also called as lydic cells, these cells. These are the cells which are responsible for the production of uh, uh, male hormones, androgens, testosterone. And uh, if you see the seminiferous tubule, it has two types of cells. One is the setole cells, which are almost pyramidal in shape. These are the setole cells. And this membrane is called as a basement membrane. Next to that is a germinal epithelium, this cell. So this is the membrane and next is the germinal epithelium. Now as you know the germinal epithelium, it will get converted into the spermatogonia and then the primary oocyte, secondary oocyte and finally the spermatitis. 
you can see the gradual movement of the cell towards the center of the lumen as it gets matured. So when it is as a germinal epithelium, it is on the periphery. As it gets matured into different stages, it finally reaches the lumen of the seminiferous tubule. And in the intertubular spaces, you can also see uh, some blood vessels lying there. The external genitalia of the male reproductive system is the penis. It's a cylindrical structure which helps in the passage of urine. It also helps in the insemination, that is the transfer of the spermatozoa into the female reproductive structure. And this shows the cross-section of the penis. Uh, the penis, it contains three masses of erectile tissues two on the top and one at the bottom. These two largest structures are called as carpora cavinosa. And the one which is present at the base, it is called as a corpus spongiosum. The urethra passes through this corpus spongiosum. And here you can see the uh, dorsal artery and uh, subcutaneous dorsal vein and the deep dorsal vein and subcutaneous lateral artery. See, during uh, erection of the penis, the blood passes through and it fills the cavities which are present here in these two masses, which gives the rigidity which helps in transforming the spermatozoa into the female reproductive system. The blood which enters into the artery, it fills these gaps and the backflow is prevented by the constriction of the veins, which leads to the erection. This uh, carpus spongiosum in the anterior end of the penis, it gets swollen and it forms the glands. The penis is covered by a skin and in the front part it is called as a foreskin which could be retracted back. So next uh, we will see about the female reproductive system. The female reproductive system is a little complex than the male reproductive system because the function of male reproductive system is just to produce the gametes and to pass it to the female. But for the female reproductive system, apart from producing the gamete, it has the role of fertilizing and nourishing the offspring. So it is a bit complex. So it does gamete formation and nurturing the fetus. It consists of a pair of ovaries, one on each side. The oviducts on each side the uterus, the vagina, and the external genitalia. It is located in the pelvic region. Apart from this, there are a pair of uh, mammary glands. So, the mammary glands plus the ovary, oviduct, uterus, and the vagina all together, they support in the process of ovulation, fertilization, pregnancy, childbirth, and child care. So this is the structure of the ovary. The ovary is the primary female sex organ and it produces the female gamete. It is located one on each side of the lower abdomen. It is elliptical, more like the shape of an almond. And if you see the size of the ovary, it ranges from 2 to 4 centimeter in length. It is having a cover which is made up of cuboidal epithelial cells, which is called as the germinal epithelium. The germinal epithelium. And this germinal epithelium encloses a stroma. So here you can see the germinal epithelium and outside to that germinal epithelium is a, is a visceral peritoneum. 
So next to the germinal epithelium is a visceral peritoneum and inside it encloses the stroma. The stroma is divided into two regions, an outer cortex and the inner medulla. Below the germinal epithelium is a layer of dense connective tissue. This is called as tunica albiginia. Tunica albiginia. The cortex, which is the outer part, it, it appears more denser and granular because of the presence of the ovarian follicles. These follicles are in different stages. The medulla, it consists of loose connective tissues, the central part, and it contains abundant blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and nerve fibers. The ovaries are attached to the uterus by an ovarian ligament. You can see the ovarian ligament here. Apart from this, the broad ligament of the uterus, which is a, a peritoneal wall, it gets attached with the ovary. So the ovary is held in position by these two ligaments. One is the ovarian ligament and the a broad ligament. The broad ligament is also called as a mesovarium. It is also called as a mesovarium. Next is the fallopian tubules, which is also called as the uterine tubule or the ovita. Its length ranges from 10 to 12 centimeter. The proximal part is modified into a funnel shape, which is called as the infundibulum. The infundibulum, it has finger-like projections, which are called as fimbri. These fimbri, it helps in connect, collecting the ovum, which is released by the ovary. So it's just like finger grasping an egg and passing it into the fallopian tube. So this infundibulum, it leads to the ampulla. The ampulla is the widest part of the fallopian tube and it is the longest part. The ampulla leads to isthmus. The meaning of the word isthmus is a narrow strip. So this isthmus is the shortest part of the fallopian tubule. It is thick wall and it is very narrow. And this isthmus leads to the last part which is called as the uterine part. This uterine part of the fallopian tubule, it passes through the uterine wall. It communicates with the uterine cavity. So, the function of this fallopian tubule is to collect the ovum and convey it to the uterine cavity. The next part is the uterus. The uterus is also, ca also called as metra or hystera or womb. It has the shape of an inverted pear. So inverted pear shape. It is hollow, it has a cavity inside and it is muscular. These muscles help in the contraction. And the uterine is highly vascularized Uterus is located in the pelvic cavity between the bladder and the rectum. The uterus consists of three parts. The first part is the uterine fundus. The word fundus means opposite to the aperture. So here this is the aperture. So this part is opposite to the aperture and it is called as a fundus. And it is having a dome shape. The fallopian tubules opens into this fundus. The uterus, the next part is the carnoa. It is not corona, it is carnoa. This is the upper corners of the uterus. 
it is only here the fallopian tube it opens so the spelling is c o r n u a carnua the next part is the body it is also called as a carpus it is the main part it gets narrowed down inferiorly and it continues with the cervix the word cervix it means neck so the cervix is the neck of the uterus the neck opens into the vagina so the cavity uh, cavity of the cervix is called as a cervical canal which opens into the vagina the cervical canal and the space in the vagina together they form the birth canal now let us see about the wall of the uterus the uterus is made up of thick muscles and it has three layers one is the outermost perimetrium next is the middle myometrium and the last is the endometrium the perimetrium is the outermost it is very thin it is a covering of the peritoneum it is made up of peritoneum the myometrium is a middle layer it is thick it is thick you can see the thickness here and it is made up of smooth muscles these smooth muscles helps in the contraction during labor the innermost layer it is called as the endometrium it is glandular it contains lot of glandules and it lines the cavity of the uterus this undergoes periodical cyclical changes which forms the menstrual cycle so the function of this uterus is one is it is responsible for the menstrual cycle the embryo the developing embryo gets attached to the wall of the uterus it helps in the nourishment it helps in the protection and it also helps in the beginning of the labor so the next part is a vagina the word vagina means it's a sheath or a scabbard scabbard means in tamil what we call as uh, wall urai so because it looks like a sheath it is called as vagina it is a tube it is actually a tube a fibromuscular tubular structure about 10 cm in length and it is highly stretchable it connects the cervix to the exterior so it connects the cervix to the exterior and the opening is called as a vaginal orifice this vaginal orifice is partly covered by a membranous structure called as the hymen the hymen it gets ruptured during the first uh, coitus but in some women it may remain persist even after the coitus and this hymen may rupture due to some sports activities like uh, cycling and other activities so the normal belief that if hymen is not ruptured the women is said to be virgin is not substantiated because it can get ruptured by many other activities and uh, the function of this vagina is it provides a passage for the menstrual flow it acts as a receptacle for the sperm and it forms a part of the birth canal now let us see the external genitalia of the female it is also called as a vulva so what is external genitalia the structures the sexual structures or the reproductive structures found outside the vagina they form the external genitalia so the first structure is the mons pubis this part mons means mount so this part this mons pubis it is the anterior most portion 
it it contains a cushion of fat tissues and it is covered by the skin and the pubic hair the function of the mons pubis is this mons pubis the skin there it contains lot of glands which sebaceous glands which secretes pheromones which causes sexual attraction next is the labia major or labia majora so these are two folds see here this is the lateral view of the female reproductive system <coughs> Uh, system so you can see only one fold so it is a continuation of the mons pubis and it is a fleshy fold it forms the boundary of the vulva and it extends downwards from the mons pubis and this is partly covered by, covered by the hair this labia majora it contains numerous sebaceous glands and it is homologous to the scrotum of the male the next structure is the labia minora or labium minor these are again two small folds of the skin they lie under the labia majora so just next to the labia majora is the labia minora and they also contains numerous oil glands And another part is the clitoris here the posterior it is lying in the posterior part of the mons pubis it is a finger like structure it is homologous to glans penis of the male this clitoris also contains erectile tissues and it is also called as reduced penis the difference between the glans penis and the clitoris is the gland spinis on its center it contains the urethra which is not present in clitoris and in the middle line of the vulva there are two orifices one is the urethral orifice and the other one is the vaginal orifice now let us see the glands involved in the female reproductive system first is the vestibular gland The vestibular gland is of two types. One is a lesser vestibular gland and the other is a greater vestibular glands. The lesser vestibular glands it is also called as a paraurethral gland or it is also called as the glands of skin glands of skin. They lie on either side of the urethral orifice. If this is the urethral orifice there are numerous glands on the sides of the urethral orifice they are called as the glands of skin or the paraurethral glands their function is to secrete mucus and the other gland which is the greater gland or bartholin's gland they are just a pair of gland one on each side of the vaginal orifice it is not on the urethral orifice they lie on the sides of the vaginal orifice and they are also called as the bartholin's glands they secrete a viscid fluid which helps in lubrication so here we see the cross section of the human mammarian glands actually there are a pair of mammary glands these are nothing but modified sweat glands it is present in both sexes male and female in female it's functional and in male it's rudimentary and they are located over the pectoral major muscle which forms the chest muscle the pectoral major muscle is here it lies above that and it is in the front wall of the thorax until puberty it is undeveloped at the time of puberty because of the production of estrogen and progesterone they influence the development of the development of the mammary gland it has a projection in the front which is called as a nipple 
it is surrounded by a highly pigmented area which is called as the areola. The areola also contains large amount of sebaceous glands which are called as the areolar glands. Their function is they produce some secretions which reduces cracking in the nipples. Internally, the mammary gland it consists of three parts. One is the glandular tissues, the fat tissues, and the fibrous tissues. So these three, they together, they constitute the mammary gland. First, let us see about the glandular tissue. Each breast, it consists of 2 to 25 lobes of glandular tissues. These lobes are separated by fat as well as by connective tissues. If you look at each lobe, there are a number of grape-like clusters. These clusters are called as the alveoli or acne and they are the one which secrete the milk. They open into the mammary ducts. You can see here the lobules open into the that is the alveoli open into the mammary ducts and many such mammary ducts they join together to form the mammary ampulla and these connect to the lactiferous ducts under the nipple the lactiferous ducts they expand and they form the sinuses lactiferous sinuses these sinuses act as a reservoir for milk the lactiferous ducts finally opens by a minute pore which is present in the nipple so each lactiferous opens independently in the nipple and the next component is the fibrous tissue it supports both the alveoli and the ducts the fatty or adipose tissues which is the third component it lies between the lobes and it also covers the surface so the fat is present in between the lobes and also on the surface of the gland the size of the breast it depends on the amount of fat present in it and there is no correlation between the size of the breast and the efficiency of lactation